Hello. Thank you for being here. Namo myoho renge kyo. Namo myoho renge kyo. Namo myoho renge kyo. Today's Go Show is on the teaching, the practice, and the proof. You know, Nichiren writes these letters sometimes in very intimate ways when he's talking to a specific people or a small group of people that are either his lay followers or instructions to his closer circle of uh, other teachers that he disseminates uh, teachings to so that they will then um, have tools for teaching others, lay people and other uh, groups, the Sangha. Uh, sometimes the teachings, the letters are written in a, a more, um, a more I don't know, formal, but a, a different way of scholarship when he knows he's addressing those teachers in his inner circle specifically, and the teachings tend to be more direct, uh, with direct uh uh, a lot of quotations from the sutra. Um, and then there are the other types of letters that are more, uh, more like doctrinal proofs where he, they're, they're, uh, those letters are very select in their audience, uh, very much directed to either, uh, recent converts from um, uh, other schools of Buddhism or his inner circle of, uh, of teachers like himself that uh, he really needs to nail down conceptually um, the, uh, the teachings within the lifespan chapter and the, and the, the, the scholarship of Lotus teaching and, and how it derives its place, its ultimate method from the entire history, uh, scholarship of Buddhism. Um, and then he has teachings or letters that are meant for specifically uh, powerful people, uh, like the ruler or the ruling clan of his day, uh, governments, uh, leaders of other sects, uh, those letters tend to be uh, quite strongly authoritarian in the, in a way because it's an authoritarian time. But um, those letters are extremely scholar uh, um, scholar driven, I should say. Uh, they're they're uh, they they rely heavily on quotations and sources, and they build proofs uh, to, up, to support uh, the conjecture that Nitrin is making to them to, to, to educate and to um, uh, derive their confidence in, in the teaching or the, um, the direction he's giving those people for the way they should behave and they should enact their actions, their authority, their power. Um, but throughout all of these, from the intimate to the, the, uh, uh, governance issues, um, Nitrin relies a lot on quotations from the teachings, either the Lotus Sutra alone, uh, often, uh, the Lotus Sutra, yes, but with further scholarship deeper into the, uh, uh the history of scholarship, teaching, expedient means within all the teachings. And even outside the teachings, he will use uh, popular uh, fables, folklore from the cultures surrounding the path of Buddhism. So folklore from Japan, certainly because that's where he is, but folklore that goes, you know, Japan has a deep history coming through China uh, and uh, kind of, well, 
they, they've always had a seesaw relationship, right? Uh, Japan understands that it is, you know, um, an outgrowth of population from the Asian continent, but at the same time, they're deeply nationalistic, right? And so they don't, they're not fond of admitting or even acknowledging uh, that they have anything to do with the Chinese. So the, it's an odd thing, but this is how we humans tend to behave, right? Once we think something is ours, then everything else is is almost almost an enemy. It's something that challenges that ownership. Uh, I've talked to it's attachment, right? Uh, we we want to own things, people, so on. Um, but all of that is to say that sometimes, very often, I think when we uh, read uh, the sutra or when we read certainly the Gosho, Nichiren's writings, um, it, it's easy to get wrapped up in the, the stories and, the, and the, the expedient means, especially as Westerners, because the frame of reference for all the storytelling and folklore and stories, it isn't ours. We're not familiar with it from childhood. You know, if I, if I say to you as a Westerner, and, and I apologize for you, those of you who are watching from Indonesia and Japan and other places. I don't mean to leave you out of this conversation. I'm just speaking to those people that are uh, more of European descent, Americans, Canadians, uh, which is the part of the world I'm living in. Um, to, to the Westerner, if I say Robin Hood, they immediately have some sort of, they may not know the whole story, but they get the con concept of Robin Hood. So um, there are a lot of uh, stories and fables and, and mythologies like that, that in Asia, children grow up with. So it's very familiar to them. So all Nietzsche has to do is drop a few words about those and they immediately, oh, I get this now. So to the Westerner, that can be a bit of a stumbling block. And uh, so I don't want you to get stuck on that stuff. Um, just to understand what it is. Okay. Uh, and again, uh, try to understand the, the meaning. And if you have to, uh, if one of those th references catches your ear, uh, by all means, research it. I, it's all part of study. Uh, and educate yourself. This the the wonder of the cultures of the worlds and the way other human beings uh, deal with things. Uh, it, we're all dealing with the same stuff, but uh, our context, our frame of reference, our culture, uh, the diversity of that is fascinating. And you can learn a lot studying it uh, if you didn't grow up with it. And a lot of times growing up with those kinds of stories, uh, you only know them in a cursory fashion where the beauty might elude you. So advantages, disadvantages to each. I just want you to, to acknowledge what they are because in this Go Show, once again, Nietzsche is going to make a lot of use of the stories. And... Uh, so in order to get you in the right mindset, uh, I want to tell you a little story from my Western perspective, okay? So if you're a, a Eurasian person or, or a, um, a non-Westerner, quote unquote, um, I hope you enjoy this story. If you're a Westerner, I think uh, it, it'll, it's an easy story, an easy analogy, and you know, one of my Sylvanian little drifts, but I think it'll prepare you mentally for what Nietzsche is trying to describe uh, about a very important aspect of uh, Buddhist teaching, um, how it's taught and why it's taught in this way. And indeed, why is Namu Myoho Renge Kyo right for this time we live in now, and it wasn't right for people 2,000 years ago? Excuse me. And that's the point of this Go Show. So, picture a child. Some of you are parents, some of you have been parents, some of you are yet to be parents. 
But even if it challenges our memory, I think all of us would agree that when a child is very young, less than a year old, and, and you hear this and it's a colloquialism, we say children are little sponges. When we talk about, again, Buddhism is mental, right? So Buddhism is mental. <laughs> that would make an interesting t-shirt. Anyway, <laughs> um, children, little children are sponges because what they do is they look at the world like this. <laughs> Everything is amazing. Everything is brand new. Everything is an opportunity to own Look at that attachment. It's right there. <laughs> but I don't want to belabor the attachment thing too much, but hey, <laughs> there's a teaching moment. Look at a baby as it looks the minute it's either suckling, sleeping, or right. <laughs> um, that amazement is so amazing <laughs> that to us, though, when we observe it, it's almost, it's almost incomprehensible. And yet, as adults, we're doing the same thing. We just, we've learned to control our facial expressions for one thing. <laughs> but on with the story. My point is, as I've, you've heard me repeat many times, we are our own teachers. In this 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 wordplay that we have of saying "I will teach you" um, is kind of an odd odd description of the uh, sequence of events. Uh, you may demonstrate something by your behavior more than with your words, uh, but I, as the student. Uh, will certainly learn, but I learn by teaching myself through, right, observation. And Buddhism is all about observation. But it's not only about observation of what's in my world, but it's observation in the mind, of the mind, within, through, about the mind. That's Buddhism. Another t-shirt. <laughs> okay. So, teaching, in other words, at that level, it, it happens instantaneously. When a, when a baby looks at you, it's learning. It's teaching itself. Look at that odd-looking person. Look at those eyeballs. Look at those eyeballs darting about in that head. Look at that mouth moving. Oh, sound is coming out. You ever seen a little baby go, you know, try and touch your mouth? It's totally fascinating. Wow, there's sounds coming out of there and there's all sorts of stuff going on in that mouth. And what, what does that feel like? What, what, what is that, right? Amazing curiosity. Curiosity driven by, I want, I want, I want, I want. I mean, nothing's a better example of Buddhist proof than right there. <gasps> proof, what am I saying? And that's what this Go Show's about. There's actual proof going on there. The teaching is happening within the child. Right? The, uh, again, what's the title? The teaching, the practice, and the proof. The teachings going on just by observation in that child. The practices trying to figure it out, own it, have it, touch it. Kids put everything in their mouth. Is it something I can eat? Is it something I can eat? Is it something I can eat? What's that taste like? Oh, wow, wood has a weird flavor. Mm, what is that? Paint? It doesn't have those words yet, but it's figuring it out. It's practicing life. 
and it's practicing what it's seeing as the behavior of its world. It's that world belongs to it like your world belongs to you. And the proof is, I can't eat that. <laughs> right? That doesn't mean every now and again I won't stick it in my mouth when my teeth start coming through my gums and going crazy. I'll remember uh, that that wood wasn't uh, as hard as that brick or that rock. And maybe I can chew on this and alleviate some of the pressure I'm feeling on my tooth. <laughs> Right? Very straightforward thinking. So there it is. The teaching happening in the, in the mind. Practice more, more, more. Proof. I mean, touch it, feel it, taste it, look at it. Very simple for a baby. Now, after a couple of years of this, two, three, four, That little baby, that little mind has taught itself a vast amount of stuff. Pretty familiar about how running under tables doesn't work. <laughs> Bang! Ow! Wah! My three-year-old keeps trying to run under the table, forgetting that there's a forehead above its eyes and smacks it right <laughs> into the edge of the table. If you ever were a parent or are now, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Some lessons come at a cost. They're just harder to learn. And it takes longer. Now, those are things that it's not learning by observing others. It's learning through itself. That mind and that teaching is different. That's developing now into a mind that has to experience something for itself on its own terms before it can inculcate knowledge. That's quite a shift. So at that period of time, that person, that mind is still teaching itself. It's practicing, albeit broader, more complex experience. And the proof is sometimes immediate or requires repetition to remove some of what it's learned because until that point it thought I can run, I, I can walk, I can run, I can do, I can fly, right? Until, ouch, oh, there are limits to this. So proof takes on a different nature, but it, it doesn't come as quickly. For the little baby, proof is just in that moment that it's happening. For the more developed mind, there's obstacles to get things immediately. Some things come easy, some things not so much. They have to be personally experienced in a different way, almost like they have to overcome stuff that's been learned before that was not quite right. They didn't know that then, but they do, not, they do now. So it takes them a little longer sometimes to learn. Now fast forward a few more years until you get an early teenager, not quite a young adult, but somebody who's starting to figure out how to claim their own space and identity in the world. At least that's what they think they were doing, right? We've all been there. Now the teaching becomes more difficult and so the practice sometimes um, runs into hitches and starts 
and the proof can be very difficult. Because that mind, the teenager's mind, is not only continuing voraciously to learn and teach itself, but now it's identified itself very firmly in certain th lessons that it's taught itself that may not be reasonable. They, they're just built, identity now is being built on a small data set. And that data set, being small, can be very prejudiced and very have many predilections, wants, earthly desires are still flowing moment to moment. But the decisions based on those desires don't have a large amount of information. And yet, the adamancy to which one will adhere to that data set is very strong because it's tied so much to that developing ego and identity, right? So that proof, a teenager doesn't need proof. Their own thinking of a data set that they identify with is all the proof they need. So it's very hard to get to proof, to get to learning deeply because everything becomes this shallow data set. It's not until that child, that teenager, grows into a young adult that they start to run, in, run, in, run into themselves. How many of us at age 25, and if you're not there yet, prepare, uh, in your mid-20s, You'll have occasions with your friends or alone or whatever you're doing to think back on being 15, to think back on being 18, to think back on being 20 and think to yourself either privately or with others. You remember we used to actually believe that this, this, this. Man, I don't know how I, I thought that was absolutely true. Now I look at it and I go, man, you <laughs> what were you thinking, my past me? <laughs> uh, now it starts being a little bit easier to learn before, before you leap, as it were. And... Um, Unfortunately, maybe, I don't know if that's the right word. As we get older and older, we get into our 40s. By the time you're in your 40s, part of you is kind of humble. Because you realize not only how stubbornly off the mark you've been on, by now, several things. You may still be adhering very strongly to things, don't get me wrong. But... You've had to challenge yourself so many times now by the time you're in your 40s, certainly in your 50s, that your humility starts to grow. You start to keep your mouth shut before you jump into things and say things that you know that later on you might go, good, why did I let that come out of my mouth, <laughs> right? So in a way... You've softened your teaching style, your self-teaching, your learning style, and your humility starts to have more respect for others around you who maybe you're now observing your teenager or somebody else's teenager and thinking, oh, they're making great decisions or They've got a long road, <laughs> right? And unfortunately, I think, uh, the, as the human experience goes, it's not until you get into your later life that you can finally back off a little bit. And even some days, I, I thought myself, I thought, how did I make it this far? <laughs> Being so stupid. <laughs> you know? Um, 
It's the kind of humility that comes from banging your head over and over and over again for years and years. Um, doing what you identify and believe, this is the truth, this is the truth. Until finally you start to think of truth as something maybe much larger than yourself. And it is at this point when somebody can bring nuance to you and simply by paying attention and considering we can start to understand and have moments of proof. The kind of proof we had when we were babies. The kind of proof that comes from those deeply profound insights that just wash through you. That kind of insight, that kind of proof. It's so life-changing. And I think as, as we get older and we experience those things, and it could happen in your 20s and your, I think by my story, it does happen. It's just how often does it happen? How much proof do you experience? How profound is it? And how does it permeate your future acts, your future awareness, your, your, your humility? You start to see a separation between the ego you and the existence you, the mind you, the spiritual you. I don't like that word. But do you know what I mean? There's like two things going on. There's this very earthly attached human that you call Brian, <laughs> right? Or whatever, Michelle. And then there's this Michelle. There's a, a Brian. Uh, what is a Brian? What is a Michelle? It's not this. It's something else. And that becomes more and more obvious as we grow with age. We grow with experience. We evolve. So, if you can follow all of that, I think you'll be able to appreciate that the evolution of mankind is that way as well. Certain concepts introduced to humanity in different parts of the world, doesn't matter. Uh, at one time, were very easy to understand. There was not a lot of complexity. But as civilizations grew, the amount of people grew, authoritarian regimes grew, control, power, negotiations, drama, wars. Humans evolved to more and more complex thinking. Part of that complexity starts to push away anything that doesn't agree with it. And then simple concepts become adamant borderlines. Nope, not going to go there. Nope, not going to believe that. And so experience becomes very visceral and physical until humankind beats itself up enough and grows enough and gets tired of warring enough, although that seems to be cyclical, um, that it's ma more matured, matured in the sense that it starts to consider its acts differently, more globally, more at larger anyway. And so subtleties begin to appear and it, became, it becomes easier and easier to make more philosophical and considered and thoughtful ideas and statements, Right? And so when Buddhism, when you read throughout Buddhism, this idea of the, the place and the time, the people's capacity, the, the country's time, is the time right for something to happen? That's what they're talking about. 
That's the concept they're talking about. So that when the Buddha Shakyamuni was alive, people could come to him, talk to him, be open to him, open to learning what he was talking about, self-teaching themselves what this man was offering them, and they could get it. Wow, that's amazing, right? But there were other people who got it, but scared the crap out of them. Said, no, no, that doesn't agree with what I know. And so the, it, there was a lot of resistance as well. Isn't that the nature of things? And then the Buddha passes, Shakyamuni's gone, and there are some great disciples and teachers that were intimate at the time he was alive and their, and their descendants who are very, very well versed and they can spread this teaching and a lot of people still can gain this proof, this personal experience. That's what proof is. But as time goes by, and a longer and longer period of time has gone by, since these great teachers now are gone, and things now have been written down because the verbal teachings are now hundreds of years away from the current experience, and all I have to do now is read and recite what my teacher tells me to read and recite, uh, it's not as intimate anymore, is it? So fewer and fewer people are absorbed and awake to getting this actual proof. Plus, there's too many other things. I've got to go set up the shop and i got to get the market going and i got taxes to pay and so on and so forth. There's Life gets more complicated and it starts to push actual experience out of the way for very mundane attachments and ta tasks, right? As cultures grow, as mankind grows, it inculcates more and more attachments that get in the way of knowing this actual experience of life. And life becomes replaced with doing and actions. How many times have you heard we are our work. We are what we do. What do you do for a living? Oh, you're one of those. We've sub our our activities for to maintain all our attachments <laughs> replace our very identity. How can we allow our identity then to experience this precious life? It becomes incredibly hard to have proof. Because now we look for proof in a paycheck. So that's why we are in the latter age, an age of tremendous obstacles. But at the same time, all of that complexity required our mind to develop tremendous ability to understand, to uh, fish out meaning, right? So this is the conundrum. At the same time as we're completely immersed in our egos and our, and our, uh, our avarice for things, thingness, our attachments, we have the capacity to understand profoundly complicated things like quantum theory, like, but, but we still don't understand relationships. <laughs> Uh, uh, so maybe there's hope. <laughs> uh, so this is the story that Buddhism constantly teaches. If you want to understand why Buddhism was taught in uh, levels or periods or, you know, accruing complexity uh, in order to get to the most simple thing, uh, this is the explanation in a very long story way. So, that's a video in itself, but I do want to start this Go Show, so let's just jump into it. But I think, hopefully I've given you enough and led your mind enough to uh, an open space where 
as I uh, read Nietzsche, who will now, you know, flex his scholarship, um, he won't lose you. Think in terms of maturity, just like a little baby. Look at the mankind that way, okay? So let's jump into it. The teaching, practice, and proof. During the 2,000 years of the former and middle days of the law, those who embraced Hinayana or provisional Mahayana Buddhism as the basis of their resolute mind and conviction and practiced these teachings in earnest could generally obtain the benefit of enlightenment. Okay? It's a little baby. It's the immediate proof, right? However... Though they believed that this benefit had come directly from the sutras on which they had chosen to rely, in light of the Lotus Sutra, no benefit ever originated from such any such provisional teachings. So, what they thought they had achieved, they truly had not. But it was exciting nonetheless for them at that time in their capacity. Right? Hard to imagine the excitement we see and the joy we see in a baby's face for our lives today. Although we're really no different. We just have a bunch of stuff in the way. The reason they were able to attain enlightenment is that all these people had already established a bond with the Lotus Sutra during the lifetime of the Buddha though the results they gained varied according to whether or not their respectivity, or receptivity had fully matured, those whose capacity to understand the Lotus Sutra was fully mature attained enlightenment during the lifetime of the Buddha, while those whose capacity was inferior and immature could not attain enlightenment at that time. But they reappeared in the former day of the law, and by embracing the provisional Mahayana teachings, such as the Vimalakirti, Brahma Excellent Thought, Meditation, Benevolent Kings, and Wisdom Sutras, they gained the same proof of enlightenment <clears throat> as, that, as that obtained by those of higher capacity during the Buddha's lifetime. So do you see, these aren't actual time leaps and stories like the story that I gave you to begin this. This is a way that expedient means works in order to convey the concept of a mature mind and the obstacles and capacities varying and in the way and how... <clears throat> people of a more matured mind, in other words, a mind who's had so much desire fulfilled that the fulfillment of desire is no longer what provides proof of enlightenment, never was. But that takes a maturity to understand. And those will understand with far less information than those with less maturity who have still to go through a tremendous amount of obstacles in order to get that aha moment. I don't want to mix you up, but mature, immature, right? Next paragraph. Thus the former day of the law possessed all three, the teaching, practice, and proof, whereas the middle day of the law, there were teaching and practice, but no longer any proof. So like a teenager... A lot of self-teaching and a lot of practice, but actual experience of enlightenment just couldn't get to it because all they were hung up on is their immediate gratification. Then to them, that, that was their enlightenment, but it's not truly enlightenment, is it? It's not until we mature further that we figure that out. Now in the latter day of the law, he continues, only the teaching remains. There is neither practice nor proof. There is no longer a single person who has formed a relationship with Shakyamuni Buddha. In other words, your Buddhaness. Those who possess the capacity to gain enlightenment through either the provisional or true Mahayana Sutras have long since disappeared. 
In this impure and evil age, again, you remember what evil is. It's just the inability to make life-affirming acts. It, we're surrounded by uh, very mundane attachments. And so that prevents us from our awakening, our enlightenment. And in Buddhist terms or in translation terms, that's evil. But it's not evil as a uh, Western concept. It's evil as a personal development concept. Namu Myoho Renge Kyo of the Lifespan Chapter, the heart of the essential teachings, should be planted as the seeds of Buddhahood for the first time in the hearts of all those who commit the five cardinal sins and slander the correct teachings. This is what is indicated in the Lifespan Chapter, where it states, quote, I will leave this good medicine here. You should take it and not worry that it will not cure you. So that's the, the big doctor fable that he <clears throat> references quite often. Very, very dry throat and mouth uh, these days. So I apologize. I keep taking drinks. Uh, but uh, I, I have to. I won't be able to speak. My mouth will just seize up. <laughs> okay. Let's continue. In the past, in the middle day of the law of the Buddha, awesome sound king, not a single person knew of the three treasures. However, Bodhisattva never disparaging appeared, and to all living beings he declared the teaching of the twenty-four characters that the Buddha, awesome sound king, had expounded. All those who heard this twenty-four character teaching, without a single exception, were later reborn with Bodhisattva never disparaging, and were at last able to attain the benefit of enlightenment. This was solely because they had already received the seeds of Buddhahood when they first heard the teaching. And that's another way of saying uh, Buddhahood exists right now in your life. It's just that it takes a lot of teaching in order to disable, push out of the way, all of our obfuscations, our, our attachments, our desires, our earthly mind, our Buddha mind cannot be seen. It's not that it can't reach us, it's always here. It's just that our human minds, our mind of distractions, discernment, identification, ego, uh, desire, all our attachments, we're so busy shuffling all of that around in our minds that we can't see through all of that noise to our clear Buddha nature. That, that aha, that observation that we see in a two-month-old baby. I'm not saying we're trying to return to our babiness. I'm saying that our awareness and our ability to sense our enlightenment, our actual Buddhaness, our actual proof. There's a lot less in the way. Follow? The same thing occurs, he goes on, in our present era. Bodhisattva never disparaging's age was the middle day of the law, whereas this age is the defiled latter day of the law. He was a practitioner at the initial stage of rejoicing, and I, Nichiren, am an ordinary practitioner at the stage of hearing the name and words of the truth. He sowed the seeds of Buddhahood with the twenty-four characters, while I do so with only the five characters of Myoho Renge Kyo. Although the ages are different, the process of attaining Buddhahood is exactly the same. Now see how all of this makes sense? Buddhahood hasn't changed. It's never changed. It's always been there. It's always been the same. It's just the manner of obstacles, the amount of obstacles that we put in our own human minds that obfuscated from us. And over time, we've gotten much more complex and our minds much more filled with all manner of things. And it's displaced our, easy, our simple observation of the preciousness of life 
and our Buddhaness, our uh, awakening to that. You you might even say that if you go back far enough, it didn't require an awakening. You simply experienced your enlightenment. It just weren't so many things in the way. But as mankind evolved, our concerns from just finding something to eat grew to our concerns of politics and what have you. We have a lot more stuff going on in our heads that's preoccupying us and we don't spend any time being awake. So now we have to awaken, right? All right, now he's going to adopt the old question and answer period. So let's see what he does. Question. You've mentioned above that the teaching, practice, and proof are not all present in each of the three periods of the former, middle, and latter day of the law. If so, how do you explain the great teacher Miao Lo's statement, quote, the beginning of the latter day of the law will not be without inconspicuous benefit, for it is the time when the great teaching will be propagated, end quote. Well, that's a statement from attachment, isn't it? Answer. The meaning of this passage is that those who obtained benefit during the former day and middle days of the law received quote-unquote conspicuous benefit because the relationship they formed with the Lotus Sutra during the lifetime of the Buddha had finally matured. On the other hand, those born today in the latter day of the law received the seeds of Buddhahood for the first time and their benefit is therefore inconspicuous. So what does that mean, conspicuous and inconspicuous? Put simply, now go back to that baby. When you see that face, right? That's conspicuous. That baby is experiencing some level of, of experience and joy that's unfathomable to us. Now, when you and I sit with our Gohonzon and we chant for an hour and we feel light, almost levitated with energy and we have a smile, but we feel that smile more in here than we do, you know, we, we, some of us might do that. <laughs> I think I have, <laughs> maybe just now. <laughs> but what I mean to say is that sensation, that mental enlightenment that we feel, that's very internal. It's inconspicuous but it's no less enlightenment. You follow? So, Nietzsche continues, the teaching, practice, and proof of this age differ greatly from those of Hinayana, provisional Mahayana, the Lotus Sutra teachings, or the theoretical teachings of the Lotus Sutra. There is no one now who can gain benefits like those of the former and middle days of the law. According to Miao Lo's commentary, the benefits in the latter day are inconspicuous, sorry, and people can therefore neither perceive nor understand them. This is why it's so critical to practice, because we live in a time of teaching like we're doing right here. But this isn't practice. This is part of the practice. But this is study, right? This is teaching. We must chant. Gohonzon is our tool. Mandala of Gohonzon. Awaken that Gohonzon. Awaken your Buddha-ness. You have to act. You have to take action. That's the practice. Which also includes bodhisattva behavior. Because that's the level at which we need to commit to really, really inculcate, push in this Buddha knowledge so that that gate can open and we can experience the proof. What is the proof? Enlightenment. The experience of enlightenment. That's proof. But that's on us.
Question. Is there any sutra passage which says that inconspicuous benefits are limited to the latter day of the law? Answer. A passage from the Medicine King chapter in the seventh volume of the Lotus Sutra reads, quote, This sutra provides good medicine for the ills of the people of Jampudvipa. If a person who has an illness is able to hear this sutra, then his illness will be wiped out and he will know neither old age nor death. End quote. Now, don't take that literal. It is literal in the sense that that's what you experience in that moment. Remember, our lives are moment to moment. So I'm sure you can remember a time when you were so elated about something, some experience you were having internally. You no longer were conscious of time, of your ailments, of your boo-boos, of your emotional traumas. You simply felt this great release. We've all felt it. But what Buddhism does is identify that release as liberation. Liberation from what? From attachment. In that moment, you are feeling your extant Buddhahood. You may not understand that, and that's why we study and we practice, so that we can capture those moments in our minds and really appreciate them for what they are. That's the kind of release we're trying to achieve moment to moment so it doesn't just go away and get replaced by what? Back to the same old, same old. Desires in, desires out. <laughs> the great teacher Miao Lo says, quote, to regard the last 500 year period after the Buddha's passing as the time when no one can attain benefit is a superficial viewpoint. Now this goes back to what I was saying about the teenager in us. All we're trying to do is accrue. And like earlier ages and past ages, as Buddhism says, accrual was a form of sensing or feeling enlightenment but it's it's not a complete enlightenment is it because it's still attached to attachment <laughs> the beginning of the latter day of the law will not be without inconspicuous benefit for it is the time when the great teaching will be propagated the last 500 year period corresponds to that time end quote so this is the time for the teaching because we need this teaching to puncture that idea, that avarice, that greed for stuff, people, money, power. It's all the same attachment. And it obfuscates that release, that beautiful experience, timeless Buddhaness, that deep, deep experience of life itself life without all of the accrual of stuff and people and power and so on and so forth question the passages whoop, where are we time wise oh this is getting long okay i like to take breaks at questions so with the next question uh we'll start part two Thanks so much for sitting with me this long. I, I hope, and, and please comment, because I notice, uh, you know, the watch times are not uh, as long as the videos. So maybe you watch in chunks, and that's okay. If you think I should work more diligently to make maybe a maximum 30-minute long video for all of these, it means I'll have more parts. You know, we'll be on part 27 of something. <laughs> but if it's easier for you to digest these talks, these lessons, um, in a shorter period of time, please say so in the comments. Um, you know, there's a lot of popular forums now online on YouTube, certainly, that go on for two hours, sometimes four hours. 
And I think there's a lot of valid validity to that because you get a steamroller of, of thinking going. And it's nice to stay in that, right, and develop that. Um, so I don't mind. About an hour long, I'm totally comfortable doing that. And by the same token, if you think, no, man, go for it. I'd like you to read an entire Go show. If it takes 30 minutes or 30 hours, just sit down and do it. I'll be with you. Well, let me know that too, okay? I need your feedback. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep doing what I want to do. <laughs> uh, so I do this for both of us. So I'll take a little latitude, but you give me what you need, and I'll work toward that as well. All right? Namu Thanks for being here. See you in the next one. Oops.